Thanks very much for coming along to this session on inequality in the UK, its effects and what we think about it. Uh, and it nicely follows on from uh, the previous session on well-being, which was looking at uh, issues around quality of life in Europe and distribution and inequality was one of the key themes that the previous speaker referred to. And obviously it's part of a wider political debate at the moment with bankers bonuses, squeezed middle and all of these terms floating around at the moment. Um, and the RSS has got a long history of grappling with these sorts of issues, uh, booth and beverage uh, in our history. Uh, and only this year uh, we had a, a, a section meeting on wealth inequality and then the beverage lecture was given by Danny Dawling who was also focusing on inequality. So this is a kind of theme that uh, runs and runs within the RSS. So today we've got two excellent speakers for you. Uh, Kate Pickett, who's a professor of epi epidemiology at the University of York, uh, and she's the co-author of The Spirit Level with Richard Wilkinson, uh, which has been a very popular book uh, looking at the issue of inequality in the UK uh, and other societies, and was named as one of the top 10 books of the decade by the New Statesman. And we've got Alison Park, who's head of society and social change at NatSen, which is the social research body, and she manages the British Social Attitude Survey from which she'll be drawing on today. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to Kate Pickett. Thank you. When we published The Spirit Level, actually, we were contacted by some statisticians who said we'd made things too simple left numbers off scales, um, not published um, p-values in the book. Um, and actually, we never published anything this simple, but it really is this simple. Um, our work shows that as income inequality increases, so do health and social problems. And so this morning, I want to take you through a little bit of the evidence, a little bit about why we started studying that, but I want to focus mostly on whether or not we can interpret this as a causal relationship. That's going to look very foggy to most of you, like smoke coming out of a chimney. But what we're looking at here are the names of different countries on that graph. So all that, all that blur are the names of different countries um, with their average life expectancy plotted up the side against average income per person, GDP per person. And you can see that in the early stages of economic growth, as countries get richer and richer, um, health improves very rapidly, but beyond a certain point, it plateaus out, and that association between average incomes per person and health is lost. And so we're interested in the countries on the top flat part of that curve, the rich developed market democracies, where that link between increasing income and wealth and health disappears. And there are those countries, um, the countries we focused on in the spirit level, rich market democracies above a certain size. Again, life expectancy plotted up the side and gross national income per head along the bottom. And you can see that on the um, right, there are countries like Norway and USA, the sort of equally wealthy um, and countries um, that are much poorer, Israel, Portugal, that have very different life expectancies. And there's no association between the two. And yet we all know, if we're involved in social statistics, that within every single one of those societies, there is a relationship between income and health. Um, here it is for quite a few years ago, um, life expectancy in different neighborhoods, um, the richest neighborhoods, um, over to the left. I'm really bad at left and right, so I'll, you'll have to keep checking in. And the poorest um, over on the right. And there's that gradient in life expectancy that we're all probably very familiar with. So income means something important for health within a country, but it doesn't seem to matter between. And it's that paradox um, that we're trying to understand. And clearly what it's telling us is that it's relative position within the society that matters and that it's a gradient that even if you live in the sort of second most affluent kinds of neighborhoods your life expectancy is slightly less than if you live in the very most affluent so clearly we're not talking about an issue of absolute poverty here <laughs> 
Now, that same um, lack of association between health and average incomes per person is also true for lots of other health and social problems. And we developed an index of these problems, all of which have a social gradient within particular societies, um, including life expectancy and infant mortality and obesity, so measures of physical health, but also mental illness, and other things that we might call social problems, um, low educational scores of 15-year-olds, infant mort um, I mentioned infant mortality rates, I think, homicide rates and the level of imprisonment, rates of teenage birth, low levels of trust, and social mobility. And if you put all of those things into a very simple index, weighted equally, again, you see no relationship um, between that index and gross national income per head. So you've got countries like the USA at the top right with a lot of problems um, and high incomes, Norway with a very low level of problems, um, and then at the other end of the scale, Portugal with a lot of problems, Spain with far fewer. But if we take that very same index of health and social problems and plot it instead against a measure of income inequality, it's a very different picture, a very um, strong and significant relationship so that if you know a country's level of income inequality, you can quite accurately predict its performance on this index of health and social problems. So at the more unequal end on the right, the USA, Portugal, UK, New Zealand, scoring high on inequality and health and social problems, and Japan and the Scandinavian countries down at the more equal end. So that's the sort of um, proper representation of that first very, very simple graph. <laughs> I'll just tell you about the measure of inequality that we're using, um, plotted along the x-axis there. It's the ratio of the incomes of the top fifth of the population to the bottom fifth. And in the more equal countries, so Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the top fifth earn about three and a half to four times those of the bottom fifth, whereas in the more unequal countries, Australia, UK, Portugal, USA, and Singapore here, um, it ranges between seven and ten times as much. But how do we know that that picture is right? How do we know that what we're looking at is not simply a correlation that can be explained by something else, but is actually a causal relationship, and therefore we ought to attach more um, policy relevance to it and ought to be acting in ways to reduce inequality? Well, as I'm sure you'll all know, we can't do experiments in epidemiology. We're an observational science, and so we rely on having a body of evidence that allows us to make causal inference. And over the decades, have developed a set of causal criteria um, to try and assess whether or not what we're seeing is true. So we need to be sure that cause precedes effect, um, if an association is strong or exhibits a dose-response relationship, that helps us to think it might be causal. We look for consistency across different settings. Um, we look for a plausible and coherent explanation of what we're seeing. If we're lucky, we sometimes get to see what happens when a particular exposure stops. But most importantly, we have to think about whether or not there are alternative explanations, third factors or external fa factors, that explain the relationships we see. So I want to show you some of that wider body of evidence that convinces us what we're seeing is a causal relationship, um, to see what you think of that as well. So first, temporal sequence. Is this a reverse causality effect, or do we actually know that income inequality measured at a certain point of time is followed by an increase in health and social problems? Does the temporal sequence make sense? These are the results from a meta-analysis published by Condo and colleagues in the BMJ a couple of years ago. And the meta-analysis is of multi-level analyses of income inequality measured at a certain point in time and mortality um, in cohort studies. So these are longitudinal studies with the income inequality measured at baseline and the mortality experience 
followed through time. And there is a modest but statistically significant impact of inequality on health across these cohort studies um, that actually, if you think about the population attributable risk of that, adds up to millions of premature deaths in the OECD countries alone. It's very difficult to study um, change in income inequality and some of the outcomes we're interested in. Partly because not many countries have good long series of comparable income inequality data, but also because we're very unclear about when we might expect to see an impact of a change in inequality um, over time. For some things like infant mortality, we might expect a fairly rapid impact. For others, like life expectancy, we might expect there to be a much longer lag because we know that life expectancy is affected by things that happen in pregnancy, in early childhood, and accumulate through life. Um, these figures come from a paper by Zeng in this year's Social Science and Medicine, and he's looking at changing income inequality in the United States and changing mortality. And what he finds is a lagged pattern that income inequality doesn't exert its um, effect on mortality risk immediately, but it begins at about five years post the change in state level income inequality, peaks at around seven years, and then becomes statistically insignificant after 12. So that you do see this sort of period of effect that then diminishes. And he found that that was true, however, he measured. Um, income inequality. We've just completed, although not yet published, a review of pooled time series analyses of changes in income inequality and crime, which is, crime was one of the things we were interested in. There's quite strong support for um, the relationship between changing income inequality and property crime. There's also quite strong evidence for changing income inequality um, and the murder rate. So the murder rate goes up when income inequalities widen. But if you look at violent crime overall, it's a much fuzzier picture. We think that's probably due to um, differences in reporting of violent crimes across different countries, whereas homicide seems to be measured quite consistently um, and probably most reliably. And in this chart, you can see that the murder rate in the United States, that's the red line across time from 1985 through the mid-2000s, um, has pretty much sort of tracked along with changing income inequality, the 90-10 ratio being there. So the evidence is starting to come through and starting to accumulate that we see the expected changes in health and social problems after changes in income inequality. The criteria around strength of association is a sort of a somewhat um, floppy one, I think. We see a very strong correlation between income inequality and our index of health and social problems. It's also very strong for some of the individual components of that relationship. Here are children dropping out of high school, the percentage dropping out of high school on the y-axis against a measure of income inequality for different US states. So it's quite, quite a strong relationship. Some of the others we look at are, are much weaker. Um, the relationship with life expectancy is weaker. Teenage births is very strong. Obesity is a bit weaker. Because, of course, we would never say that income inequality is the only cause of any of these problems, just that it is a root cause. And some of them are more influenced by other factors. I think the criteria of consistency is a much more important one. And one of the alternative explanations that we knew people might offer for the relationships we were seeing was cultural. There's something culturally distinct about the Scandinavian countries or the English-speaking countries that explains the patterns we see. And so we thought it was important to look at these relationships in two independent test beds that couldn't be confounded by those national differences in culture or welfare regimes. Here's one of those um, factors included in our index of health and social problems. 
It's the degree to which random samples of the adult population in each country think that others can be trusted or not. So it's a measure of generalized trust. About two thirds of those in the more equal countries trust others. Less than a fifth um, in Portugal, down at the more unequal end. And if we do the same thing with the 50 US states, um, again, looking at income inequality and trust, data from their general social survey, we see exactly the same pattern. And actually, the scale is, is quite similar. Around two thirds of the populations of New Hampshire, Vermont, um, Iowa trust other people. And those in the more unequal states, the worst here, Alabama and Mississippi, it's down to around a fifth, as in the international data set. And we repeated all of our analyses for the 50 states of the USA, where we could, um, as well as in the rich developed countries. And the pattern is remarkably consistent. And other researchers have looked at different regions of the world, income inequality and health in the Latin American region, income inequality and health in regions of China, um, income inequality and health in Eastern Europe. And in setting after setting, these same associations appear. There's the index of health and social problems for the different US states. Um, a wider scatter than with our rich developed countries, but it contain, contains the same set of problems and the same statistically significant relationship. But we also thought it was important to look at other people's measures of well-being and other outcomes um, so that we could avoid the accusation that we just cherry-picked the problems we looked at to suit ourselves. So we looked at the UNICEF Index of Child Well-Being, which was published in 2007. And that also shows a significant relationship with income inequality. So the most unequal countries have lower levels of child well-being than the more equal ones. But I suppose what really matters is whether or not we have a plausible and coherent story about why we might be so sensitive to relative social position, income inequality, and rank. And I think this is where social epidemiology can help us because for three decades we've accumulated a huge body of evidence on the importance of social status for health, on social connections, social capital, friendship and support, and on the impact of the early child experience. And we know that these psychosocial factors affect the way we behave, they affect our biology through the mechanism of chronic stress, they affect our cognition, they affect the way we feel. I'll give you just a couple of examples. These data come from a meta-analysis of experiments where psychologists try to find out what stresses people the most. So they got college students into rooms and gave them nasty things to do. And what stresses people the most is not being given a problem to do like difficult mathematics, it's being made to do that problem and then read out your score. So it's tasks where other people can judge you, what psychologists call those that contain social evaluative threat that most stress people out, um, which is why my stress hormones will be much higher now than all of yours um, sitting in the audience. They affect the way we think too, social evaluative threat threatens the way we think. These data come from Indian school children asked to do puzzles, how many could they solve in a given time. When they didn't know each other's cast, they performed equally well. When they announced their cast to one another, the performance of the low caste boys plummeted. See the same effect with black and white American college and high school students. And women perform less well on mathematical and spatial tasks if they're told that men, it's been proven that men are better at them, um, although they will do equally well under a different test condition. And Alex Wood, a um, psychologist at Manchester, has shown that income rank predicts the development of mental distress over time. Absolute income doesn't. Um, and rank you know, predicts how unwell people become over time. We expected from that that actually what we're seeing in more unequal countries is a greater importance of status, more status competition, more social evaluative threat. And one of the things we expected was that people might respond to that 
by either becoming more depressed, which we see in our mental illness statistics, or by sort of bigging themselves up. And recently, this paper was published showing that self-enhancement is higher in more unequal societies. If you live in a more unequal society, you're more likely to say you drive better than average, you're cleverer than most people, and you're nicer. We don't get much chance to look at cessation of exposure of income inequality, but the picture we've got now is that Japan is a very equal society with a low level of health and social problems, and the USA very unequal with much higher level of problems. But if we'd looked at the end of the Second World War, we would have seen those countries in completely opposite positions. Japan was much more unequal, ranked much lower in the sort of international health league tables, and the USA did much better, which is also an important lesson that our levels of income inequality are not fixed characteristics of our cultures. The meta-analyses show that what we're looking at isn't an effect, a compositional effect of individual income or education because they control for that and they still find a contextual effect of inequality. Other people have suggested that welfare regimes are an explanation, but there have been some path analyses by Elgar and colleagues that show it's changes in income inequality that link to changes in trust that link to changes in homicide and health outcomes, not public spending. I mentioned that US analyses help us um, disentangle the effects of culture, national culture. And ethnic heterogeneity is another alternative explanation that a lot of people have explored. But recent studies by RAM from the University of Illinois, um, both internationally and across US states, show that ethnic heterogeneity doesn't explain the relationships between income inequality and health. There may be other alternative explanations that we and others have not yet thought of, but so far, taking an Occam's razor approach, um, income inequality seems to be the best explanation with a plausible coherent pathway to that high level of health and social problems we see. But of course, the theory is only as good so far as it predicts future findings. When we started our work, um, there were very few countries that had data on mental illness. It's the prevalence of mental illness in the past year up the side, the proportions. Um, it seemed to be associated with income inequality, but very few countries. As the World Health Organization has produced more data, it fits into the picture very nicely. And similarly, when we started looking at social mobility, very few countries had data, although high levels of social mobility were associated with low levels of income inequality and low social mobility with high levels of inequality. Not many countries there, but now we have more data and they fit the expected pattern. So I'm going to stop there. That's a really fast run through. I hope I kept within my 20 minutes of what the data show us about the impact of income inequality on a whole range of different problems and in a whole range of different settings. And we're also accumulating not only more and more evidence of those associations, but a deeper and better understanding of the psychosocial pathways that lead from income inequality and the importance of social standing, social status and relative rank to the kinds of health and social problems that concern so many of us in our societies today. Thanks very much for listening. I am going to talk to you today about a, um, a range of issues that are very relevant to some of the things that Kate's just been talking about. And I'm going to draw primarily on data from a survey that's been carried out by the organisation I work for for the last 30 years. So I'm going to start off by just giving you a bit of background information about that data and where it comes from. I'm then going to focus for a while on what the data tells us about public um, perceptions of equality of outcome, focusing particularly on income inequality. I'm then going to look at um, equality of opportunity and people's views about that and their perceptions um, as to the extent to which um, that happens at the moment within the UK. And then I'm going to finish off by looking at what that really tells us about the possible role for government in relation to equality within Britain today. So a bit of information first about the survey, for those of you who don't know it. 
Um, it's a survey that's been carried out for 30 years. It's carried out to very high standards. It uses random probability sampling um, and interviews over 3,500 people aged 18 plus within Britain every year. Um, and it covers a really wide range of topics. Um, across a range of social, moral and political issues. And its aim is really to try and tease out the nuances that underpin public opinion. So it tries to take a, um, a deeper look, I suppose, than you'd get with a standard um, opinion poll. And it really tries to look at the nuance within public opinion and try and get a better understanding about how groups vary in the views that they hold. One of the real strengths of BSA, and one of the things that's grown as the um, survey has got older, is the fact that you can now use it to look back over 30 years and look at how attitudes and values have changed over that time period. We've got data collected for most years since 1983, and although not every survey, not every question is repeated regularly, there is a real emphasis on trying wherever possible to repeat questions so that we can get a sense about how um, attitudes are changing. Now, I'm going to draw on two um, sort of sets of questions in the talk I give today. So the first set are of a fairly standard set that we ask every year. So we've got annual um, data points, if you like, on those questions. But the bulk of it, I'm going to draw on a fantastic set of questions that were asked back in 2009 as part of something called the International Social Survey Programme, which is basically a global enterprise that involves 40 to 50 countries across the world who agree a, a common set of questions um, that are then asked in each country um, to a sort of certain methodological standard. And in 2009, the topic was inequality. Um, and the, the great thing about that set of data is that you've not only got the ability to look at how countries compare, but for many of the countries, you've got data collection um, from previous years. So you can actually look at how countries are changing over time. Um, and then the final sort of general point to make is that I'm going to draw heavily on two fantastic chapters that were in our 27th report, um, one by Karen Rowlandson and her colleagues, and the other by Anthony Heath and his colleagues, both of which make a lot of use of that 2009 data that I just mentioned. So equality of outcome. I'm going to focus here on income inequality. So it, it won't surprise you to know that there is considerable concern about income inequality within the UK. So what I've shown here is the proportion of people who think that um, the gap between those with high incomes and those with low incomes in Britain today is too large. And I guess the headline is A, that it's around 8 in 10 people, so it's a clear majority, and B, that there hasn't been that much change over time, although obviously there's a ceiling effect. Um, notice too that the earliest data collection point here is 1987, which is a shame because it would have been nice to have had data collected from earlier on in the 1980s because we know that the 1980s saw considerable growth in income inequality and it would be nice to have seen whether or not public opinion shifted in response to that. But clearly, this is quite an abstract way of getting people to think about inequality. So in order to dig down a bit deeper, I'm now going to look at some questions that were part of this um, International Social Survey Programme module. Um, and what these questions do, there's a huge set, so I'm just showing a little um, selection here. They basically start with a set of different occupations, and then they ask a series of questions about these different occupations. And I'm making things easy by focusing at an occupation at the bottom and an occupation towards the top. So the bottom, I'm talking about an unskilled factory worker, and towards the top, I'm talking about the chairman of a large company. And the first set of questions we asked was how much people thought someone in that occupation would earn each year. And what I'm showing here is the average salary that we got across all the respondents. So what you can see here is that the average annual salary for an unskilled factory worker was seen to be £13,000, um, compared with £200,000 for the chairman of a large company. So there's a ratio of about 15. Uh, the chairman of the large company earns about 15 times more than the unskilled factory worker. So the key point here is that people are clearly very aware of pay differentials and the fact they exist. Um, as an aside, if you actually try and map this information onto real salaries to the extent that that's possible, um, people are actually quite good at predicting the real salaries for people towards the bottom end of the income scale, but they tend to be quite bad at predicting salaries for those at the top, and they tend to underestimate those salaries rather than overestimate them. 
So the next set of questions we asked was, okay, that's what you think they should be paid. Sorry, that's what you think they are paid. What do you think they should, paid, should be paid? And what you can see here is that the ideal salary, if you like, for this unskilled factory worker goes up slightly from 13,000 to 16,000. And the ideal salary for the chairman of the large company is halved from 200,000 to 100,000. So that means that the, the ideal ratio is only a ratio of six compared with the perceived ratio of 15. And that, that isn't just about the two particular jobs I'm looking at here. That holds true if you look at the range of different jobs um, that we considered. The other point that's worth making is that the um, perceived ratio is widening. So people are aware of the fact um, that there's a growing discrepancy between what people are paid at the bottom of the income level and what people are paid at the top. Um, but there's very little change in the ideal ratio there at all. So the more abstract measure of concern about income inequality that I talked about right at the beginning is matched by a, a sense that there's a growing divergence between pay for people in um, top jobs and pay for people at the bottom of the income spectrum. So moving from equality of outcome to equality of opportunity, um, if, you, if you try and tackle this in quite a superficial way, you find that the vast majority of people think that equal opportunity is a good thing, 94%. But it's also very clear that around 8 in 10 people think that currently within Britain, um, there, is, there is a high degree of privilege and that children from better off families start off with more advantage in life than those from less well off families. Now clearly this is very superficial. So again, we tried to dig down and look at this in more detail. Um, and the way we did this, again using this ISSP International Social Survey data, is by giving people a very long list of characteristics or attributes and asking people how important they thought each of them was when it came to somebody doing well in life. So the top three things by far um, were hard work, good education and, and ambition. So over seven in ten people thought those attributes were either essential, very important to somebody doing well in life. Now at face value all of those can be called meritocratic. Um, characteristics, how hard someone works, the level of ambition they have, and their education, although clearly education is also something that's going to be influenced by your background. If you then look at the next set of characteristics we talked about, you find clear evidence that people think privilege matters as well, although it's not nearly as um, pronounced as was the case in relation to the um, characteristics I just mentioned. So a third of people think that knowing the right people is either essential or very important to doing well in life, and around the same proportion think that about having well-educated parents. And at about half that proportion, 14%, think that coming from a wealthy family helps. And then just to finish off at the bottom of the scale, we found a small proportion, under 1 in 10 in every case, thinking that the more ascriptive characteristics, your religion, your ethnicity and your gender, um, were either essential or very important in how well you did. Now that's not to say that people don't think these things matter, it's that they don't think these things matter as much as the things at the top of the table there. And drawing all of that together, you do get quite a clear sense that people see Britain as being a qualified meritocracy. Um, individual characteristics to do with hard work and ambition matter the most when it comes to whether or not somebody does well, but privilege also um, has an important role to play. So if you use that information, you can then categorise people into a number of different groups. Um, one way of doing this is to identify the utopians who think it's all down to pretty meritocratic factors and they give very little weight to non-meritocratic ones. Realists who think it's a mixture of the two and then cynics who think it's all down to ascribed characteristics like, um, like gender or ethnicity or who think it's all about family background. Um, in terms of how British society breaks down into those groups, the majority just are realists, so just over half um, think that it's a mixture of both characteristics, closely followed by 41% who think um, that it's really mainly down to meritocratic factors, and then a very small proportion who can be called cynics. So, just to sum up where I've got to so far, you've got very clear evidence of concern about equality of outcome and equality of opportunity, but also quite a clear sense um, that meritocratic factors have a really key role to play in how well somebody does in life. 
So what I'm going to do now is talk about what that means for government and what government's role should be, because obviously it has potentially a very important one. So traditionally, one way in which government can try and influence inequality is through income redistribution. That's one very obvious way in which it can try and um, rebalance inequality between rich and poor. Um, but of course, there are lots of other more indirect methods that government can use, and the most obvious one of those, or one of them, would be um, the welfare state and the provision of benefits to people who are on lower incomes. So I'm just going to say a little bit about what British Social Attitude says about public attitudes in this area. So the first question is, does high concern about income inequality mean a lot of support for um, redistribution of income by government? And the very obvious answer there is no. Um, about a third of people think that government should redistribute income from well-off um, groups to less well-off ones, and the proportion who think that has declined quite clearly over time. Um, at its highest point, just over a half of people thought this, and that was back in the late 1980s and late early 1990s. If you then add on um, data from another question, this is looking at the proportion of people who think the government should spend more on welfare benefits for the poor. And what you can see here is a steeper decline. Um, so at, at, at its highest, 61% um, of people wanted to see more benefits, sorry, more spending on benefits from these groups, and it's now down to 29%. So it's halved um, over the lifetime of the survey. You can then add on, I mean, I'm just showing a flavour of the questions we've got. There are, there are many more than this. But if you then add on people's views about welfare, you can see that over this same period, you've got increasing scepticism about benefits and the impact that they have on benefit recipients. So the line I've just added here, the dark green one, is basically showing the proportion of people who think that un unemployment benefits are too high and discourage people from finding work. That now stands at 54%. So just over half of people take that view, and that's double the rate who thought that back in 1993. And then the final one, just to layer on, is um, a, a very strongly worded question about whether welfare benefits prevent people from standing on their own feet. And what you can see here is, again, just over half, 55% of people think this, um, double the proportion who took that view in 1993 when it was only 25%. Um, and it's very interesting to compare what people's views are now um, to what they looked like in the early 1990s, because, of course, that was a period of similar economic difficulty and recession. And what's very clear from this is that British public opinion on issues like welfare and redistribution is dramatically different um, to what it looked like in the 1980s and 1990s. And what's also clear is that there seems to be this key period in the 1990s when opinion started to change. Um, I won't go into it now. I'm happy to take questions about it later, but certainly work we've done suggests that a really key part of that was the changing um, stance taken by the Labour Party on issues like welfare and redistribution and, and that did convince a number of people um, to change their views, particularly Labour Party supporters and that's partly what's driving this change. So how do we reconcile those findings, the ones I've just shown, with the concern about income inequality and equality of opportunity that we found earlier? Um, that's a very big question. I'm going to just go through two possible ways of doing that now. So the first one is really about what we mean by redistribution, unpacking the R word. So I suppose one really key point to make here is that even though support for redistribution has fallen massively, a significant proportion, over a fifth, don't have a view and are undecided. And we know from the work I mentioned earlier that people's views in this area are very influenced by political rhetoric, debate, what's going on in the press. So there is definitely scope there for, for people's um, for opinion to shift and change again um, in the future if, if that is an area that political parties really want to engage with. It's also very clear that people don't oppose all redistribution. Um, if you ask about very explicit redistribution, people find it quite scary. But if you actually go into more implicit ways of redistributing um, uh, in income and wealth from rich to poor, people tend to be more supportive. We also know from work that was done with colleagues at um, LSE that the actual word redistribution can be quite scary for some. So when you talk about it without using the word, you tend to get slightly higher. Um, without using the word, you tend to get slightly higher levels of support. Um, and then the final set of bullets on here is really showing um, 
illustrating that point. So it's basically looking at some questions that we asked in 2009, which presented people with a huge list of ways in which government could try and reduce the income gap. The most popular one is, is the first one listed there, better education or training, 62%. Um, so that clearly speaks to the equality of opportunity um, angle. But the second most popular was reduced taxes for those on lower incomes, which, which is clearly something that does have a redistributive effect. The second thing that I think it's really important to try and address is understanding where people's views on inequality, well, views on redistribution and welfare fit into their wider views about inequality and society and fairness. So earlier on we saw very clearly that large proportions of people think that the main thing that drives somebody doing well in work is ambition hard work, a good education, and so on. And I think there is more work that, that we can do and others can do at trying to understand the link between belief um, in a sort of meritocratic society and how that links to people's views about welfare and redistribution. It's also very useful to get a handle on why people think income inequality exists and what they think causes it. So a really large proportion of people think that it's just an inevitable part of modern life and there's very little government can do to influence it. But there's also a significant minority of people who think it can be avoided or who think that it's morally wrong. And if you look at the views of that group, you find that they're, not surprisingly, much more likely to favour direct intervention by government, active redistribution, um, more spending on welfare, welfare and so on. So just to finish off, um, what I hope I have got across in a very quick tour of the data is that there is very widespread and quite considerable concern about both the quality of um, outcome and opportunity, um, but that's within a context whereby um, large proportions of people think that the main things that influence whether or not somebody does well in life are, are largely meritocratic. At the same time, we've seen this very clear fall in support for redistribution and particularly um, in support for more spending on welfare, which is allied with this growing cynicism um, and reluctance um, to, to spend more on people who have fallen on hard times. But despite all of that, there's still perceived to be a very clear role for government in trying to reduce inequality, both by improving opportunities for people and to some extent by reducing income inequality. Thank you.